when, so I'm Philip Kemsky, I'm, I'm a postdoc at Princeton University. Um, yeah, when Mateusz and I decided about the, the order of the, the talks here today, we, we thought that it would be good to give the discussion first to provide a bit of background, but now I'm actually feeling a bit worried that we may have saturated the topic. Uh, <laughs> and I'm also the person standing between you and lunch, so uh, I don't quite like that, to be honest. Hopefully there will be no hangry comments coming uh, at the end of this talk. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the goal was achieved that the, the, the discussion kind of nicely set the stage for, for why cosmic ray transport is important and why we should be caring about the details of cosmic ray transport, including cosmic ray transport in interstellar turbulence. And this is work with uh, a number of people. Many are actually in this room. It's particularly useful to have the chair of the of the session be uh, on the slides, so hopefully I'll get a little bit more time. Um, okay, so just to recap the main point from the points from the discussion, just to really make sure we, we know uh, what the relevant issues are. Um, cosmic rays charge relativistic particles that pervade many astrophysical environments, including the, uh, the Milky Way. And the fact that they pervade these environments is really nice because we can perform extremely beautiful measurements of these particles in the solar neighborhood. And um, what you measure, for example, when you measure their flux, is that as a function of cosmic ray energy, you get this beautiful power loss spectrum over many decades in energy. And without going into the details of how these things are measured, the general interpretation is that this power law is set by a combination of acceleration processes in environments like supernova explosions and subsequent energy-dependent escape from the galaxy. Okay, and just to put in some numbers, uh, you know, on, in a statistically average sense, uh, cosmic rays are accelerated by supernova with some spectrum like e to the minus 2.2, and that spectrum gets steepened by energy-dependent escape from the galaxy to the observed 2.7 spectrum or so, minus 2.7. And so the energy dependence of the escape time is something like e to the minus 0.5 power. I'm not going to talk about the acceleration part, I'll talk about the transport physics, which has relevance for things like galactic winds, molecular clouds, etc. Okay, so the, the scaling with energy is important, the normalization is also important. So at a GEV, cosmic rays spend of order 10 million years in the galaxy, which is many orders of magnitude longer than the light crossing time of the Milky Way, which implies that something is preventing these particles from escaping at the speed of light ballistically. And the standard paradigm that has sort of dominated the community over the last five or six decades is that this long confinement time is because the Milky Way is filled with small amplitude magnetic field fluctuations that can gyro resonantly scatter the particles and so lengthen their residence time. And of particular interest are these resonant fluctuations uh, that live on scales comparable to the cosmic ray gyro radius, meaning that Low energy particles interact with short wavelength waves. High energy particles interact with long wavelength waves. And what's actually quite remarkable about this picture is that if you plug in, you just assume that the magnetic field fluctuations in the galaxy are described by a Kolmogorov-like spectrum of fluctuations from, an a, from a parsec to an AU, roughly speaking, you can actually get a diffusion coefficient that match, uh, matches Milky Way data remarkably well, as Mateusz argued in the discussion. Now, the problem with this is, again, just reminding you about the key takeaways from the discussion about transport. One issue is that MHD turbulence is not quite Komogorov-like. It's not isotropic. And in particular, the alphanic part of the turbulence, the incompressible part, has a tendency to form structures that are highly elongated in the direction of the local magnetic field. And what was shown quite nicely by Ben Chandran in 2000 is that in these anisotropic turbulence models, particle scattering is highly suppressed. So much so that you get a result that is opposite to what we measure in the Milky Way, and that is that low energy particles uh, would be predicted to be confined more poorly than high energy particles. So for this reason, um, Jan and Lazarian in 2004 had this, made this interesting point that, you know, given that incompressible MHD turbulence doesn't work, maybe we should be looking at the more general case of compressive MHD. Uh, and in particular, they, en they envisioned that uh, MHD fast modes might be important because if you look at fast modes in MHD turbulence, they seem to obey uh, better isotropy than incompressible fluctuations. 
with the caveat being, that was already realized at the time, that fast nodes are subject to, to significant damping, and so it is not entirely clear that you can get a nice cascade down to AU scales, but maybe at least at the largest scales you can get significant scattering by fast nodes. So the issue being that fast nodes have a relatively large viscous scale. So the widespread picture in the community over the last really two get decades has been that uh, you have these volume filling waves, the scattered particles, not necessarily due to a single cascade, but maybe because of a fast mode cascade on large scales, and then on small scales you have an additional source of waves where the fast modes are damped uh, that may come from a process like the cosmic ray streaming instability. So this has been a very, very common working picture in the community. But it has not really been tested that much when, in terms of comparing to the observations we have until uh, fairly recently. And so this was done both numerically in galaxy simulations by the FIRE collaboration led by Phil Hopkins and more analytically, well, really analytically by, uh, by me and my PhD advisor, Elliot, um, where we basically looked at these two transport models that we had, and we, we tried to basically reproduce the data that we observed in the Milky Way, okay? So and this is this boron to carbon ratio that, is, that was shown earlier. It, it is a direct probe of the transport of the particles in the Milky Way. In the FIRE paper, you can see that there's strong disagreement between the models and the data. In our case, we had a beautiful analytic model so we could tune any, choose any parameters we wanted. Uh, so then we could, in principle, reproduce the data, but it required so much fine-tuning that the answer seemed sort of, uh, you know, it, it seemed very unlikely to be true given how much fine-tuning it required. And there was an additional issue uh, of, of a more theoretical nature uh, that is actually not entirely clear that a cascade of fast modes really exists in MHD turbulence, regardless of damping effects due to collisionless effects. Uh, there, there is an additional issue that fast modes being compressive modes actually have a tendency to steepen on a time scale that is much faster than the weak nonlinear cascade time. And, and so this quite likely actually suppresses the, uh, the scattering picture. This is something that was actually in the, in the hydrodynamic community for a very long time, uh, going back to Peng's point about people rediscovering things, I guess. Uh, but in the com cosmic ray community, that mind impression was that this was not really um, uh, realized that much. So, so it seems like there are both observational and theoretical issues in the current transport paradigms. Um, and to me, this implies that we may need a new theory of cosmic ray transport and turbulence. And I think there is actually the community has re reached a mature state uh, that, that w many groups independently realize this now. Um, what was mentioned before in the discussion is this picture of mirror diffusion of cosmic rays. That's one possibility. Uh, I'll talk about something else here, uh, but it's very much related. Okay, um, so the direction that we decided to go in is uh, to think a bit more about what has been thrown out the window in traditional cosmic ray transport models. And one of uh, such things that was thrown out was turbulent intermittency, okay? So uh, the standard transport theories tend to assume that all fluctuations are Gaussian and described by random phases. But if you actually look at turbulent fields produced in a simulation self consistently, we know that picture is not right. And this was nicely demonstrated by Maron and Goldreich in 2001. They looked at a turbulent snapshot, they went into Fourier space, randomized all the phases, went back to real space, and the two snapshots look nothing alike. The power spectra are the same, but, uh, but they look nothing alike. So our eyes are very good at picking up these structures and, you know, maybe particles would be very good at that too. So we can think, you can, we can clearly identify or hypothesize that in these two snapshots, particle transport would be drastically different. On the right, we would have this volume filling scattering picture that has been in the community for a very long time, even though we don't really have a good theory for that. Um, on the left-hand side, we, we might envision a situation where the particle scattering is actually not volume filling, but happens preferentially in locations of these coherent structures. So what do I mean by coherent structures? Um, so far, I've kept the term quite vague. There are many coherent structures you can look at, 
the, the ones we, we uh, decided to look for uh, is, is, uh, is the role of field reversals in particle transport, okay? And, and in particular, in MHD turbulence, there seems to be a tendency to form field reversals on scales much smaller than you would naively expect based on things like, for example, the power spectrum. And this could be, for example, due to the formation of current sheets on small scales, which may or may not, uh, depending on what you believe in, uh, disrupt into things like plasmoids. So we decided to test whether, uh, you know, such field reversals may play a role in cosmic ray transport. Um, but more generally, we really decided to look for things that have not been accounted for in traditional models of transport. And to do this, we, we did the most obvious thing. We, uh, we ran a bunch of image turbulence simulations. We ran a bunch of test particles through these simulations, and we checked what we got. Uh, and we decided to go for a particular regime, regime of MHD turbulence, that is uh, MHD turbulence without a strong guide field. The reason being twofold, one that the strong guide field case was studied more in the cosmic ray transport literature. And the other reason being that without a strong guide field, you actually sort of, you maximize the, the chance of seeing an important effect due to these field reversals. That's the two, two reasons. So these are current densities from our simulations, one of delta B over B naught of four, 10, and then these two simulations uh, were uh, complemented by a high magnetic Prandtl number uh, dynamo simulation taken from Alisa Galishnikova's uh, dynamo work. Um, and so the first thing we could do, that was the relatively easy part, uh, that we could track some particles through these fields and measure uh, their effective scattering coefficients. I'm not going to go into the details of how we measure them. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to discuss later, uh, but I don't think I have the time. Uh, but one thing that we, we found is that in a qualitatively similar way to the Milky Way data, we found better confinement or higher scattering weights at low particle gyro radii in the resolved energy range. I wouldn't claim we get any kind of behavior that is you know, exactly what we measure in the Milky Way. We don't really have clear power laws or anything, uh, but it's a, it's a promising, uh, promising direction. Now, this is the easy part. Extracting the key physics is much harder because, you know, we're looking for these field reversals and their effect on particle transport. But once you have these field reversals, particle orbits become very chaotic and very messy. So interpreting what, what we're seeing is not that easy. Um, what ended up being important or at least useful for, for convincing ourselves that we have some handle of what is going on, was to think a bit more about the geometry of the magnetic field lines uh, in these simulations, rather than just, for example, the power spectrum. And the relevant geometry is that of field lines having relatively long parallel coherence lengths and relatively short perpendicular coherence lengths. So if you're familiar with the dynamo literature, you may think of it as sort of being reminiscent of these magnetic fields, that are organized into folded structures. They may not be perfect folds if you have a lot of turbulence going on, but, but roughly that picture may hold. Now, even though the parallel coherence length is quite long in these folds, the, the field lines still bend on relatively small scales, okay? And in particular, the bending occurs on scales that is comparable to the perpendicular reversal scale of the field lines. And what is nice about this folded picture is that the bends really do correspond to very localized, highly spatially intermittent scattering. Because you can imagine a particle entering the fold from the left-hand side. I guess I lost my pointer. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Uh, I'll paint a picture with my words. Uh, <laughs> the particle enters the fold from the left-hand side. It propagates along the, you know, perturbed but fairly straight field for a long amount of time until it eventually encounters the sharp bend and gets strongly scattered. That's, that's, uh, that's the picture that might happen. And this is in, indeed what we tend to see in many of our particle tracks. So what is plotted here in black is uh, a magnetic field line copied three times, and then a particle propagating along that folded field uh, for the three different particle energies. And, uh, and that's shown in red. And what you can see in those tracks is that at the top, which is the largest energy, the large gyratis particle tries to enter the fold, but it can't really follow the field line as it reverses and it eventually drifts out of the fold. 
in the bottom, you see that the, the smallest gyratis particle happily adiabatically follows the fold uh, as it reverses direction. And so while the particle doesn't really experience strong scattering in the usual sense of changing its adiabatic moment, for example, it still gets scattered in a spatial sense just by following the reversing magnetic field line. And then there is an intermediate stage, which is the middle trajectory, um, which corresponds to a particle uh, trying to enter the fold, being able to reach pretty deep into the fold, but then as it approaches the regions of the highest field line curvature, the field line curvature happens to occur on a scale that is comparable to the particle gyro radius, and then the particle actually undergoes a strong scattering in its, in its adiabatic moment. And, and so then if you say, okay, we have identified two distinct scattering mechanisms in these folds, if I now say that my folds come with a certain distribution of sizes that can be estimated from the simulations, and I say that a particle gets scattered in these folds at a rate at which they traverse the parallel coherence lengths, modulated by the probability that the fold is large enough to actually scatter the particle, you can, you can use this kind of heuristic expression for the scattering rate and at least you know, compare it to the numerically extracted scattering coefficients that we measure in these simulations. And um, for sort of, there is a order unity um, coefficient that sets the normalization of these dashed lines here, uh, but, but it's actually order unity, and the curves seem to agree quite well with the extracted scattering coefficients in these simulations. So it appears to be consistent with this geometric picture we have, uh, but I really put the appears in, in asterisks. This is not a polished theory by any means. Um, it's really just an idea at this moment. It's a exploration phase. If, if, uh, yeah, it, it's really just an exploration phase, but it, it seems promising. And um, I will just say that while it may seem uh, pretty esoteric and you might wonder how relevant are dynamo fields or large delta B over B fields in the galaxy, that's a reasonable uh, concern to have. Um, there is work that actually showed up a few weeks before our work by Martin Lemoin, who is in this room and will give a talk tomorrow, but if I understood correctly, it's not gonna be the main topic of, of your talk, so I'll just briefly advertise. Um, it's a very nice paper who, uh, that looks at these things in, a, in very nice analytical detail. Um, and based on these probability, based on probability distribution functions of field line curvature and MHD turbine simulations, Martin predicts that uh, you might get better confinement at low particle energies due to these curvature scattering events, even in the case where you have a, a fairly significant guide field. Uh, doesn't, it shouldn't be too significant, but uh, I believe if that's, if you agree, you, you should comment if you don't agree with anything I said. Um, but but it, it can be a significant uh, guide field. Okay, so I'll leave you with my summary slide. Um, yesterday I still had uh, QR codes for, for papers to be linked in the summary slide. I, I decided against it. Um, but now I feel like maybe that would have been useful. Okay, and anyways, uh, you can find my papers if you... There are not that many Kemskis uh, on ADS, so uh, you'll, you'll find them easily. Okay, I'll, I'll take questions. So let's, can we, since it's not in discussion, do you mind, can we line up at the side here? It is, uh, it is very interesting uh, uh, approach. My uh, experience with um, uh, superalphanic turbulence and uh, propagation of uh, cosmic rays in superalphanic turbulence that uh, it's a bit difficult uh, to consider the effects of intermittency in the situation that uh, your uh, uh, regions of intermittent structures are not anymore at the um, uh, inertial range. And in this situation, uh, we, uh, and this is my concern, 
uh, related to uh, whatever is uh, uh, numerical uh, effects dissipation are doing with uh, all uh, uh, physics which are uh, affecting uh, the electric fields that uh, uh, your particles are experiencing. So there is no electric field in these simulations. I should have said this probably. No, but, but in the framework of your uh, uh, you know, particle, if you consider there is the electric field, which depends on the structure of the magnetic field. And this structure is being uh, distorted by uh, the numerical effects. And this is uh, my... Yeah, that's a fair point. There is a, yeah, it is a, it is a problem in large delta B over B naught simulations that you tend to have, uh, you know, you don't really go, at least in these simulations, you don't really go to delta B over B less than one, say, uh, in the, within the inertial range of the simulation. And so it's, it's hard to extrapolate to, to much smaller scales. And, and this is something we, we plan to address in the future. My intuition right now is that in superaffinic turbulence, you might have regions even below sort of the uh, delta B over even below the trans alphanic scale, according to a power spectrum, my intuition is that you may have localized regions where it actually looks very different from strong guide field turbulence because you lose memory of the guide field um, by, by driving so strongly on large scales. That's, a, you know, that's what my intuition tells me currently. This needs to be tested and we'll see what we get. It could be, you know, I, this, is, this is why I really strongly try to advertise this as an idea rather than a polished theory. Um, because it could be that, uh, I guess, in 20 years when there's the next astrophysical turbulence conference uh, at KITP, we'll, maybe we won't even look back at this because this will be considered trash. Uh, but, uh, but hopefully we'll look back and consider this as an interesting idea. Um, we'll see. Uh, it's really beautiful. Um, do you have a numerical PDF of the mean free paths and uh, is there an analytic function that describes them? You mean at a fixed gyre radius, a PDF of, of the mean free path? Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't. But I, I can look into this if you want. Okay, and I'll, I'll get back to you. But that's a, that's a good point. Well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, levy flights, you know, long tails, all that stuff. <laughs> um, so, so you mentioned uh, Kadamsev and Pet uh, Petriashvili, and of course there is, uh, you know, this uh, book by Zakharov Lvov Falkovich. Uh, they claim different things, and last time I checked, uh, this debate has, has never been resolved, whether the cascade is stronger or steepening is stronger. And um, so you, you obtained some new results. Can you speak more about that? Um, right, so you, you may be right that may, maybe in, in the hydrodynamic community it was never really resolved. Uh, in my head, it got resolved to some extent. When I, when I just looked at the t relevant time scales for steepening versus uh, a sort of Kreichnen type weak cascade picture, the, the steepening time scale uh, or rate scales linearly with the fluctuation amplitude, whereas the weak cascade time scales quadratically with the fluctuation amplitude. So once you're in the subsonic regime, for example, one will always happen on a time scale that is faster than the other. I mean, it, it's a question of dimensionality. So in 1D, of course, it is resolved because in 1D we know there will be shocks. But in 2D and 3D, I, I don't think, I mean, there's still the same time scale arguments, but in 1D we know the answer, but in 2D and 3D we don't. Well, there, there are numerical uh, experiments that try to isolate compressive modes in, for example, high beta simulations that would... Uh, that are claimed to be fast modes. And I've done some experiments as well with this, uh, including 4D FFTs to really isolate fast modes uh, using their dispersion relation. And I believe a lot of the recent work, including what I have been seeing in my simulations, it's not really published, but unfortunately, but, but I've seen in my simulations that you, you tend to, even in subsonic turbulence, for the fast modes, you, you robustly reproduce a K to the minus two power spectrum, which, uh, you know, maybe maybe if you went to 100,000 cubed, you'd start seeing a Kreichnen, and then we will, I'll be disproven 
uh, with my idea, but but at the moment, given current capabilities, it seems to be more supportive of this shock picture than uh, uh, than the weak cascade picture. But you know, it, I, I'm not. I, I can't say uh, anything that and anything about things that may be unresolved in current simulations. But my my analytical intuition is is based on these uh, this time scale argument. Um, yeah. Uh, well, it's just a comment uh, to Andre's comment. Uh, indeed, the uh, dimensionality is uh, very important. And uh, for example, uh, I know that uh, this is, uh, uh, you are showing this plot from Shikachikin, uh reversal field. And uh, uh, my uh, somehow problem with understanding this original idea is that this studio. We, when we have uh, the uh, simulations or in 3D, we never get uh, the exact, uh, we, have, we can have, uh, uh, the reversals are very different. The reversals are very different in the uh, dynamo in 3D compared to this um, uh, nice uh, laminar. Yeah, uh, so um, I will say that my my biggest constraint with this picture is uh, that it's it's uh, to a large extent based on high magnetic quantum number dynamos and you know if once you once you go to uh, truly turbulent dynamos these kind of faults may be disrupted by additional processes. I will say though that in the case of of the high PM dynamo, both in 2D and 3D, the faults uh, seem to be there uh, and. So, sort of like as an example, I showed you this uh, these particle tracks. There are more uh, tracks that I, well, I don't have here. Um, but yeah, I would say my biggest concern with the laminar fold picture uh, is 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 the fact that it's based on high magnetic quantum number flows. Um, I, I will say though that it's actually it, it is sort of neat. What is sort of neat about the high magnetic quantum number folded picture and how we measure and the scattering coefficients we measure is that we, we measure better confinement as we go to smaller gyro radii, even though we don't have traditional turbulence in these models. Uh, which is, yeah, yeah, yeah. But these are valid concerns, I agree. Yeah. All right, um, let's thank, let's thank Philip and Hayes.